Hey there, I'm Ryan Bomi, and you're tuning into So You Want to Teach Percussion. This video series is designed particularly for my current percussion methods students. Since they aren't able to have a typical percussion methods experience due to the current global pandemic, these videos are designed to give them a foundation of the technique outside of class time so that we have more time to play when we're together. But I also hope this video series can be helpful to any music educators out there. Today, we're talking about triangle. Triangle is one of my favorite instruments. And in terms of my favorite shapes, I'd say it's probably top three. Triangle gets a bad rap just because it seems like such a simple instrument. But making good sounds on a triangle is not as easy as people think it is. And getting the hang of all the different techniques involved will give your students a much bigger appreciation for the instrument. In this video, we'll demystify the triangle so that you and your students can learn what it takes to make good sounds. We're going to look at playing position, playing technique, and beater options. So grab a triangle, and let's get this ting started. First, we're gonna talk about playing position. With our dominant hand, playing triangle is a lot like playing a drum, but the non-dominant hand has a totally different role, holding the triangle and muffling the triangle. So let's start with holding the triangle. You're gonna to wanna to invest in a triangle clip so that your students can hold the triangle easily. To hold the clip, I'm gonna hold my non-dominant hand in a C shape. Then I'm going to hold the clip like this so that the mouth of the clip is between my index and middle finger and the other end of the clip rests on my thumb. Then, you just add a triangle. Now I have the triangle in front of me like this. And I can access the bottom arm, which is where I'm gonna do most of my playing. Since I'm right-handed, I'm gonna to wanna to attach the triangle to the clip so that the open corner is to my left and the closed corner is to my right. Our general playing zone is gonna be between the center of this bottom arm and the corner. If I go towards the open corner, the sound gets a little less desirable. Staying between the center and the closed corner is gonna give me the best chance of making good characteristic sounds. Although some directors prefer to have their percussionist hold the triangle up high like this, I tend to hold my triangle a little lower so that my striking hand is more relaxed. If I have to reach up to play the instrument, my arms are going to get tired more quickly. And most triangles won't have an issue being heard, even if they're down here. Refer to Fundamental Technique Part 1, where I go over a ton of posture mistakes that your students are going to want to avoid. In this clip, you can see that I have a trap stand set up in front of me similar to most of the other instruments I've covered in this series. This allows me to pick up and put down the triangle quietly, and it also allows me to keep multiple beaters available at all times. But we'll talk more about beaters later. Now, we're gonna talk about playing technique. We learned what the non-dominant hand is doing, so now it's time to learn what the dominant hand's up to. Triangle beaters are typically very thin, so I like to hold them between my thumb, my index finger, and my middle finger. The other fingers can stay relaxed and close to the beater, but they don't have to stay on the beater all the time. From here, your students can use French grip, German grip, or American grip. No matter the grip, the goal is for the grip to be nice and relaxed so that the beater has a little bit of wiggle room. In this clip, I'm playing single notes and muffling. In addition to aiming for the middle of the bottom arm, I'm making contact with the middle of the head of my beater for quick muffling, I can just wrap my ring finger and pinky around the triangle. If I want to muffle with more of a gradual decay, I can slowly add my fingers to the triangle, gradually increasing pressure to cut out more frequencies over time. You may have noticed that I'm playing with my beater in a diagonal position. Playing the triangle this way makes the instrument vibrate a certain way, resulting in a sound filled with multiple overtones. If I play with a more horizontal beater, you'll hear more of a definite pitch. The same thing happens if I play with a vertical beater. This isn't necessarily a bad sound, but it's a sound that will be noticeable, especially if the triangle is tuned to a note that doesn't fit with the notes being played by the rest of the ensemble. With a diagonal beater, we get more overtones out of the triangle, allowing the triangle voice to blend into the texture more easily. I'll use this center spot on the bottom arm for louder notes. For softer notes, I'll play closer to the closed angle, making contact closer to the tip of the beater rather than the center. Using the tip of the beater allows me to play with less weight, which is going to help me play softer. But you aren't restricted to this one spot for playing quiet passages. No two triangles are exactly the same, and each triangle has its own unique sweet spots. 
Your students can take time to explore the triangle, looking for different playing spots that produce good sounds. I'm typically going to keep everything on this bottom arm and stroke out all the different rhythms I have. But if the rhythms are too fast for me to stroke out, I might move to this close corner where I can alternate between the bottom arm and the right arm to achieve the rhythm. Here's an example of this technique. You'll notice that I'm actually playing with a horizontal beater now. Although a horizontal beater doesn't give us the most desirable sound for isolated single notes, the lack of overtones isn't as noticeable with this faster rhythm. If I try to play this rhythm with a diagonal beater, it's technically just as easy. But since the diagonal beater activates so many frequencies, the articulation can get drowned out really easily. Using a horizontal beater for this passage is going to allow the notated rhythm to be more clear to the listener. Okay, now let's talk about rolls. Your students will see rolls in almost all of their triangle parts. You can play rolls by using the same technique we use to play fast single notes. I'm just going to keep the grip really loose and use my wrist to move the beater in this motion between this arm and this arm. The difference between rolls and fast single notes is that we want a roll to sound more like a sustained sound compared to the digga 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 that we get with fast single notes. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a roll at a loud dynamic. I'm using a diagonal beater again, which is going to help me achieve the sustained sound I'm aiming for. Here's what the roll sounds like if I keep my beater horizontal. It's not a super noticeable difference on this particular triangle, but this is typically going to sound more rhythmic. In comparison, rolling with a diagonal beater is going to produce more overtones, which is going to help us achieve a sustained sound. You'll notice that I'm crossing my non-dominant arm over my body a bit, so that I can hold the triangle in a position where I can keep my striking hand relaxed, with the striking wrist remaining as neutral as possible. Keeping this relaxation is going to allow me to roll for long periods of time without feeling discomfort in my striking wrist. You've probably seen people in TV shows and movies play triangle rolls like this. But our goal with rolls is for each note to sound consistent so that no individual notes pop out of the roll. If I'm going between three different surfaces, it's going to be harder to make each note sound consistent. It also limits how quickly I can play the roll since it takes so much time and wrist motion to move the beater all the way around the triangle. When I roll between two sides, I can aim for the same spot on each arm and move between those two spots quickly and efficiently. To play soft rolls, I'm going to move closer to the corner, decreasing the speed and distance of my beater. Remember, it's also helpful to play with the tip of the beater when you're playing soft so that you can strike the triangle with less weight. Your students will often encounter crescendo rolls and decrescendo rolls in their triangle parts. To play a crescendo, I'll start by rolling near the corner, making contact with the tip of the beater. As I crescendo, I'm going to move the beater away from the corner, and I'm going to move my point of contact with the beater closer to the center of the beater head. As a result, the beater is traveling a longer distance up and down throughout the crescendo, and the weight of each note is increasing since our point of contact on the beater is changing. I'll do the opposite for decrescendo rolls. Starting away from the corner, playing with the center of the beater head, I'll gradually move closer to the corner, moving my point of contact closer to the tip of the beater as I decrescendo. But Mr. Bohan, I'm playing a ton of different instruments in this piece, and I don't have time to pick up the triangle. Don't worry, generic percussion student. You can just clip your triangle to your music stand. I'll show you a few effective ways of mounting your triangle. Mounting the triangle is especially useful for playing fast passages if your students aren't comfortable playing them with one hand. If you're using one triangle clip, you can mount the triangle like this and play with two matching beaters on the bottom arm. Depending on the musical context, you'll want to position the triangle where you can comfortably switch between a horizontal beater and a diagonal beater. Just like soft playing when we're holding the triangle, you can play fast soft passages closer to the closed corner. Be sure to keep the beaters close together so that you have the best chance of each hand having identical sound quality. You might have noticed that this music stand is vibrating as a result of the triangle being played. Sometimes this sound won't be super noticeable when the rest of the ensemble is playing, but if it is noticeable, try mounting the triangle on a different stand. With a mounted triangle, your students have a few options for playing rolls. They can use the same technique they would use if they were holding the triangle, or they could play them with two matching beaters. Again, your students should be aware of the beater angle when they're doing either of these techniques. In terms of muffling the triangle from this position, you can use a few fingers from your non-dominant hand and make contact with the open corner, touching the ends of each of these two arms. With most triangles, this will stop the sound immediately. But if both hands are carrying a beater, it might be easier to muffle like this, where you spread out the back fingers and make contact with the side arms. You can also mount triangles with two clips. This allows the triangle to sit higher, which might be a preference for some students. With this method, the closed corner is now at the bottom, and the other two corners are being suspended by the clips. 
In terms of playing the triangle in this position, everything you did when the triangle was mounted on a single clip will work the same way here. So those are the main playing techniques your students should be aware of. Once your students see how many considerations go into playing this instrument, they're going to be way more excited about playing their triangle parts in band and orchestra. Finally, we're going to talk about beater options. There's a common idea that percussionists should use small triangle beaters to play soft and larger triangle beaters to play loud. But this idea is not entirely true or false. A bigger beater is going to be a little heavier, which means it's definitely going to have a good chance of activating more frequencies from the triangle. But small beaters can still activate a lot of frequencies at loud dynamics. And sure, small beaters are lighter, which makes it a lot easier to play soft notes. But even with this larger beater, I can still control the weight to play really soft. So let's hear three different beater sizes in action. The beater I've been using up until now is a medium sized beater. It's able to activate a lot of overtones in the triangle, and it's a good weight for loud and soft dynamics, whether I'm playing single notes or rolls. Like I said before, small beaters can also get the job done. They're most useful for softer notes and rolls, but don't think that they can't work for loud passages just as well. This is a large beater. Larger beaters are going to be heavier, which means more weight is going into the triangle with each stroke, resulting in more overtones. So these are nice for loud passages, but they can also shine at a soft dynamic. Mr. Baby, does that mean I have to have every single beater size? Not necessarily. Have your students try each beater in your band room and determine for themselves which beater is going to work best for their triangle part. And if you only have one beater in your band room, your students can most likely make their triangle parts work with that one beater. But consider investing in multiple beaters, especially if your students have to mount the triangle and play with two identical beaters. Also, if one of the beaters goes missing, your students won't have to resort to using a pencil or a chopstick. I hope this video has helped you gain a better understanding of triangle. It's not as simple as it looks, but it's also not a super difficult instrument to grasp. Once your students are more aware of everything that goes into triangle playing, they'll definitely be more engaged and interested in their triangle parts. That's it for now. I'm Ryan Bomey, and thanks for tuning in to So You Want to Teach Percussion.